I'm Cindy Boxer, and you are listening to the Fiber Artist Podcast, where we chat with artists, makers, and creatives who work with fiber, get to know their stories, how they came upon their fiber practice, and more about the person behind the work. Today, I chat with fiber artist Megan Schimmick, whose eye-popping work with wool roving propelled her into the weaving scene. Megan's work has been shown all across the United States and internationally in Sydney and Paris. You can find her on Instagram at Megan Schimmick and view more of her work at MeganSchimmick.com. Quick fun fact, Megan and I just happened to grow up about five houses away from each other in a small Michigan suburb and never really knew each other. It's been so cool to reunite through our love of fiber. Hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Megan. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's so nice to get a chance to finally talk to you. Yes, you too, Cindy. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so, I mean, I just want to kind of get right into it. Can we, we'll start with the basics. Where are you from and where do you live now? And, um, you know, what's your, what is your sort of living life situation look like right now? Um, well, I'm originally from Grand Blanc, Michigan, which is just outside of Flint. Um, and for people listening, Cindy and I grew up on the same street, like five houses apart from each other. Crazy, um, isn't it? <laughs> and um, now I'm living in Oakland, California. Um, I live in a live work loft situation with my son, who's almost seven. Very nice. Um, God, Oakland. I feel like that's such a burgeoning sort of artist community area. It must be really nice. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful. And the neighborhood I live in is called Jingle Town. Um, and it's a, it's been an art community for about the last like 30 or 40 years. And so like all, a lot of this neighborhood, it's like very industrial. And then there's a lot of art lofts. So like there's murals and mosaics and like all kinds of crazy stuff all over this neighborhood. Like That's it's not so an awesome. Like there's nothing else. It, like there aren't bars or restaurants or anything like that. It's like you live here, but it's a really cool little artsy neighborhood. Oh, cool. I, it's what I imagine uh, like Bushwick, Brooklyn to be kind of similar to and what Williamsburg yeah. used to be until it became more of sure. like a mall. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So let's go way back. What I'm really trying to get into with this podcast is um, because what what I find most fascinating when I think about other artists and other fiber artists is where did they come from and how did they get to become the fiber artists that they are now? So let's go back. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and um, and just and you can get into as much detail as you want. Um, uh-huh. What was your and then come up to what is your first experience with fiber and working with fiber and how you came to it? Sure. Um, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I was born, like I said, in, well, I was born in Flint, Michigan. I was raised in Grand Blanc. Um, and I had a pretty like, you know, nice standard Midwest suburban childhood. Like my parents were married. Um, I went to Catholic school. I have an older brother. Um, you know, we had a big backyard and, um, you know, my, when I was a kid until I was about eight, my grandparents lived around the corner from us. So I had like all this family kind of right around and, um, a neighborhood where kids were just like always out in the yards and playing together. And it was, you know, very safe and whatever, um, middle class. Uh, and, um, yeah, so that was kind of, I mean, you know, I don't know that there was anything like, I don't have any, you know, crazy childhood things that like really set me apart from anybody or, you know, anything that was difficult or anything in my childhood. Um, and were you, that were of you sort of crafty as a kid? Um, to a, I mean, I definitely loved doing like crafts and arts and, you know, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and I was always, especially my one grandmother, one who lived closer to Detroit, um, she was very crafty. And so I feel like when I'd go to her house, we'd make like and, and these are also, you know, depression era grandparents. So, so we, w- she would take like the plastic bags that you would get from the grocery store and she'd make rugs out of them. And so like, I remember doing oh, cool. that with her. <laughs> That's so cool. I've never even heard of that. <laughs> like kind of how you make like rag rugs. Yeah. Yeah. Bags from the grocery store to make them. Um, and cause like you could use them outside and stuff too, I think is part of why she would do that. Um, and she would also make, she would get like washcloths and she would make pillows out of them. And so I remember doing that with her that we would make like, and you'd put like yarn fringe around them. And like, so we'd make pillows for like our stuffed animals and stuff like that. That's so awesome. Um, yeah. So I remember doing a lot of stuff like that with her. Um, and then, you know, just like normal kids like painting and I love to color. I always had coloring books and like paper dolls and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and 
but I didn't get more into, well, and then I guess I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Then, you know, I, I, um, I started off, uh, well, I went to high school in Flint. Um, I went to this school that's called Mott Middle College High School, and it's a high school that's on a college campus so that you're able to take college classes while you're in high school. But it's it's a school that was um, really made for kids who don't function well in a, in a traditional school environment. Um, so the classroom sizes are smaller. And like I said, you can take these college classes, but it's also much kind of more like loosely structured, like there's no bells to tell you when to get to class. Um, Each class, like your attendance is separate. So, um, and there wasn't like, if you missed a class that you would like get suspended or detention or something like it was very much like put on us to be like responsible and show up to class. Um, And like we could leave campus to go out for lunch and stuff like that, which is like just pretty different than normal high school situation. Um, I feel like and, all high schools, should, all high schools should be <laughs> structured this way and giving the responsibility to this to the kid. You know, well, I think it it helped me. It prepared me a lot more, I think, for college because then it wasn't like when I went off to college, it wasn't like woohoo party. Like now I can, you know, it was like I already knew I had to be responsible. Like if I wanted to do well in a class, I had to show up. Right, right. Um, and where did and you so, go to? Where did you go to college? Um, I got my first degree at Oakland University, and then I have a degree also from Michigan State. Okay. Um, and so when I was in this high school though, after going, my first high school was Grambling High School. Um, and I don't know if I even took an art class at Grambling High School. Like it was definitely not something that I felt like was pushed in the curriculum. Whereas at Mott Middle College, it was like, you had to take art classes. It was like very, very important in the school that they right. had. You. And like, even within our, um, like regular, like in our history classes and stuff, there would usually be like an art component to it. Um, and we, but our like main art class, we had this really great, um, instructor at one point who was a Venezuelan, um, painter. And so he like really taught us about like the landscape in Venezuela and like, I mean, it was just like really interesting. Um, and you know, and then we had like pottery classes and like all this different stuff. So, and then part of, taking college classes is I took a bunch of photography classes when I was in high school, um, through the college, through the community college. Okay. I'm so jealous of your high school experience because I can (laughs) tell you, uh, I can vouch that the Grambling high school experience really did not include much art. I had one art class and it was senior year as like my elective or whatever. And it didn't like count for anything. There was, there was no, you know, there was no real education behind it. I remember just like drawing cartoons and copying, copying like, um, what was I into? Like Karopi, Karopi kind of stuff at the time. <laughs> anyway, so yes, you had a, a pretty cool high school experience. That's so awesome. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a really incredible, I feel like, and it's kind of funny because I think if you're from that area and you told people you went to that school, people were like, oh, you're a bad kid or right. like you weren't smart or something like there was definitely this like stigma attached to that high yeah. school. And when I look back on it, I'm like, jokes on you guys. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Like you're some rebellious deviant or something. Right. Exactly. Um, and it's like, no, I actually had this like really crazy high school experience where I got so much out of it. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so I took like this history of photography class, which was crazy. Like we got to build cameras and like do pinhole cameras and learn how to do like cyanotypes and like all this different stuff. And then, um, and I took, a like intro to photography class and a color photography class and like got to work in the dark room. And this is before the age of digital cameras. Right. So that right. wasn't even a thing. It was all film. Um, but so it was, it was very, um, just really different um, and really exciting to be able to do that, that kind of stuff. Um, and part of it too was um, for my high school, you also had to do an internship your senior year. Um, and I did my internship at the planetarium in Flint and cool. um job there was to develop film so like <gasps> that's so awesome um so just really really a different high school experience and I think what especially these days I feel like everyone's on lockdown at high school right totally and um, well, so when you were before you were when you were approaching high school did you mm-hmm. know that you wanted a, an experience that would be so um centered around art and creativity or did you kind yeah. of just fall into that I just fell into it because it wasn't Uh, I mean, and you grew up in the same place I did. I mean, I feel like artist was not an option for a career. Like that was, artist is a hobby at best. 100%, yep. Um, I was, you know, my, it was kind of like, okay, engineer, doctor, lawyer, teacher, uh, you know, secretary, hairdresser. Like there, I feel like the, the ideas of what you could have for a career were really narrow. Really limited, yeah. And so I never... 
I never in my life thought that I would be doing this. Like this is, was never an option at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but I really, but I really loved, um, I mean, I loved artwork, but I really loved history. And so my first degree is in history. Um, oh. and, but I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> so, um, it was kind of, you know, my parents, as I'm getting this history degree, they're kind of like, uh, so what exactly are you going to do with this? And what I actually really wanted to do was be an archivist. Which <gasps> That's is, so cool. Um, kind of interesting. Um, and so nerdy, <laughs> nerdy, which I would have loved it. Yeah, I totally. It. Um, I like get to be alone and read all day. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I can do that. Um, uh, but you know, the, there aren't many jobs and like you also can't have like a bachelor's and become an archivist. Like you usually at least have to have a master's if not a PhD. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I am not the kind of person who is going to go to school that long. Right. That's a, um, that's a really long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so after I got my degree, I worked in, um, I ran a bookstore for a long time and then um, went back to school and, and then got a degree in nutrition. And that okay. was at Michigan State because I was also, I was like, from the time I was 16, I think, 16 or 18, I was like vegetarian or vegan for oh, wow. forever. So I got like super into nutrition okay. because um, if you're vegan, you have to really learn how to eat properly. Um, and you have to learn all kinds of things about diet and like how to get all of your nutrients and stuff like that. And so I'd gotten really interested in, in nutrition, um, and went back to school for dietetics at Michigan state. Um, but anyway, in the meantime, through all of this, um, while I was in middle school, I had taken, um, home ec with Mrs. Reich, which I'm sure I so remember that. Uh, and what what pillow the, what pillow did you make? The pig. What yes, about you? I made the whale with the little three fish swimming next to it. Oh, that's so cute. I think that pig is probably still at my mom's house somewhere. Oh my god, that's so awesome. <laughs> um, and but I got really into sewing, and I made my middle school graduation dress. Oh my <laughs> god, that's incredible! Uh, Do you still have it? Do you have pictures of it? I wonder, it might still be at my mom's house. That's too cool. I'll have to look next time I go. There's a possibility. Um, But she could have also, I feel like she's like starting to purge. Yeah, yeah. After living there for almost 40 years. Right. 30 years, 30 years. I think here is 30 years that since uh, we moved to that house, um, you know, there's some stuff. Yeah. Just, (laughs) just a little bit in the, in the basement. (laughs) So nuts. Um, Yeah. So uh, yeah, so I'd gotten into sewing and then, um, later got into crochet and then knitting. And so, but like with all of that stuff, um, it's always like, I have to follow a pattern. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't, made, it wasn't like creative. It was like craft. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm, I've just picked up crochet and it's very much for me p- pattern based. I would love to feel more creative with it, but I, I don't know that I feel confident enough with it to get there, but um, now I do. Yeah. Right. So now that yeah. you have this new kind of visual, uh, just a way of seeing and thinking visually, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I would love to see you incorporate some of that. I do. I actually, you probably don't know, but oh. I've done tons of crochet stuff. A lot of the stuff that I have is crocheted. I didn't um, even realize that. Yeah, and so a lot of the sculptural stuff I do is crocheted. Oh. Um, and so you're, you're going to have to send me images so I can put them up on the um, on oh, the website yeah. next to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I can absolutely do that. Um, But yeah, so I got like, but I didn't, when I learned both like crochet and knitting, it was like, okay, I'm going to make a scarf or a blanket or, and then with knitting, I got really into it and like made sweaters and pants for gray when he was a baby and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But, um, um, I, but yes, I loved, I loved working with fiber. Um, and then I kind of got to where I'm at now through, um, in kind of a weird roundabout way. Like, so I'd had this kind of knitting and crochet thing that I had been doing. And then um, through my nutrition degree, um, I I realized pretty quickly I didn't want to be a dietitian. I didn't want to work in a hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just wasn't – I didn't feel like it was the best way to affect change was, like, going to people when they're really, really sick and then saying to them, like, oh, here, you're in the hospital, like, for COPD, um, and now you're on – uh, Kudamin, which is like a blood thinner. So like you can't eat avocados right now. And it's like, probably this person isn't like, like this isn't their main concern when they're mm-hmm. like in the hospital really, really sick. Um, and, and so what I really, and, and I was, um, 
uh, I had been very involved in the community in Flint. And even though I was going to school in East Lansing, I got really interested in um, community nutrition. And so at the time I was interning at Hurley Hospital, which is the hospital I was born at in Flint. Um, Me too. (laughs) And working with very sick populations Mm. um, and seeing everything from, you know, yeah, like people with COPD to people who have had gunshot wounds to people who had lap band surgery, like all these different people. And, you know, seeing, trying to talk to them about nutrition. Um, And then, so I would do that every Friday. And then every Saturday, I uh, was the office manager at the Flint Farmer's Market. And, um, at the time I got really, I was, so I was really interested in working with populations to try to help them use food as like more medicine. And then like also get more fresh food into people's diets and help them to incorporate it. Um, and so the farmer's market, um, I helped them to implement a program so all of the farmers could take, um, EBT or, uh, food stamps. Um, and we also had a program where during the summer when they would get, uh, their WIC benefits that we would double their, their benefits. So if they had $5 in WIC, we would like, we'd give them another five to spend at the farmer's market. Um, the Flint farmer's market, and now it's at a new location, but um, where it was before they also, and this was before my time there, they installed a bus stop right in front of the farmer's market because at the time there was not a single grocery store within the city limits of Flint. And oh so- Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Yeah, it was really awful. And so um, for anybody who lived in the city, it's like if your only option is to go to the, you know, down to the party store, the, you know, the right. corner store. Um, generally, like if there is fresh fruit, it's like maybe some apples and bananas, like you're not, and there's not going to probably be any vegetables right. and eating food out of a box or, you know, going to fast food or whatever, cause that's the food that's there. Mm-hmm. And so, so anyway, I was very passionate about community nutrition and still am obviously. Um, but so then, um, I, after I finished school, um, I moved out to Washington DC and I did nutritional research and worked with adolescent healthcare, um, and then eventually came out to California um, and was interested still in pursuing this community nutrition, worked for a farmer's market, and I taught nutrition classes to low-income populations. And through working at the farmer's market, we would also, in the wintertime, especially when a lot of the markets were closed, we got to go on farm tours, which was incredible to oh, go and see so cool. the, meet the farmers and see where all the food was coming from. And so I got really interested in agriculture. And the agriculture turned into getting really interested in animal byproducts like Mm -hmm. wool. Um, And the fiber shed was just starting. And and so then I got really interested in getting sustainable wool. And I started using that in my knitting. Um, And then uh, from there, um, my friend Ama had just started weaving. And she's like, oh, you should... And, and by this point, I had Gray, and she was like, you should come and take this weaving class. It's so amazing, this tapestry class, and blah, blah, blah. And, like, there was no way I could do it with uh, having a baby. Right, and, right. Um, and my ex-husband wasn't, you know, I mean, for he wasn't super interested in, like, having our child all day on a Saturday so I could go right, weave. Right, right. <laughs> um, not many of them are. I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to – I, I mean, that's a whole other story, but, yeah. um, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, then, um, eventually I went to go visit my parents in Grand Blank and, um, had my son with me and we were going to be there for about a month. And my parents were like, we'll watch Gray go take a class at the yarn store. And so that is where I took my first weaving class. In was Michigan. At the yarn shop in Grand Blank. I didn't um, even know there was a yarn shop in Grand Blank now. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, I took a weaving class there and, you know, the rest is history. (laughs) Yeah. You just, did you just, it, did it take off from that point where you wanted to be weaving all the time and. It was immediate. It was like, as soon as it was a scarf weaving class and Mm -hmm. I made two scarves and, um, at the time I had seen like a, like some people doing some wall hangings. Um, and so then I started just kind of like looking through like Instagram and like Pinterest and stuff. And I was just like, holy shit, like I want to do this. This is so rough. And I remember I heard Marianne Moody speak last fall at um, the Weaving Kind mm-hmm. conference. And she was talking about how when she first started weaving, how she's like, you know, and you do something and you'd think, I've just invented this new thing. And I was like, yeah, like, that's what you, you're like, you're like, I'm making a triangle. And I'm the first person who's right. ever made 
go. And then you like look and you're like, oh, or you're like, oh, I'm going to do this cool thing. And like, no one's ever done this before. And then you're like, oh, actually, no. You're like, oh, it's centuries old. (laughs) It's a century old craft. (laughs) Like, oh, yeah, I didn't just make this up in my bedroom. (laughs) Uh, um, But so, yeah, like that was, you know, then I just couldn't stop. And then. Um, a couple months after that, uh, I mean, I would wake up at like four in the morning to weave. I would, as soon as gray would go to bed at night, I would weave. And then a couple months after that, um, Nate, my ex-husband, um, got this great job offer, but we had to move to Arizona for nine months. And, um, and so we were like, okay, you know, it's no big, I mean, I can live anywhere for nine months, you know, and like, and knowing that it was short, it was fine, you know, because it's hard to move somewhere when you are an adult and you don't have any support or friends. Um, of course. And you have a small child. And so, um, but so I was like, cool, we can do this. And so we enrolled Gray a couple mornings a week in a preschool. Um, but then I had time to weave and then I took Navajo weaving classes and floor loom weaving classes. And it was like just this whole thing open. And, and because I didn't really have any friends, <laughs> I had some time to weave. Um, so it was, it was really an incredible experience to have that time that I got to really kind of just focus on this and like actually spend time working on it. Um, and then when I came back to California, um, and I started taking tapestry weaving, um, and all through this period, I mean, I was really just learning. I wasn't trying to really sell anything. I was trying right. to figure out what I was doing. And, you know, I mean, I would post things online and stuff. And, and you know, I'd have, like, occasional things where people would ask to buy something. Or um, I had a friend who asked if she could put – well, I didn't know her at the time. And she's become a friend. But she was up in Seattle, and she saw my stuff. And she said, hey, I'm having this pop-up shop. Can I at – a, at a gallery, can I, you know, have some of your work? And I was beyond flattered. And right. um, and it was, it was about um, – three and a half years ago that I started playing with roving a little bit. Okay. Um, and, but I was still really working on my tapestry practice at that point. Um, and, but that's when things, I mean, the roving is what set me apart. Right. Right. Um, you know, before that it was all learning skill. So while you were learning tapestry weaving and and even with the scarf weaving that you, when you took your first class, um, what, what were you feeling at the time? Were you feeling, I mean, I know for me personally, I was feeling extremely invigorated as far as finding something that was making me feel like creatively fulfilled and just even just having something tangible to touch at the end, which I hadn't had in a really long time. And what I, my own, in the job I was doing at the time, like, what were you feeling at this point? Were you seeing a future in it or just, just, just enjoying the process of learning? Um, well, so I guess to back up a little, when, when I had my son, I had stopped working um, okay. at the farmer's market because um, it was a nonprofit. And I'm sure as many people know, things in California in the Bay Area are, you know, kind of expensive. And um, putting my son in in any kind of daycare was going to cost more money than what I was making. Right. Um, and so obviously, that becomes a pretty simple choice of like, do I give my kid to somebody else? And I'm like, I'm working for free. Right. Um, or do I stay home with him? And so it, it was it was very difficult on us financially for us to do that, but it was like there wasn't really a choice. Right. Um, and so I think when I started weaving, I and that was really hard for me because I was I'm not the person who's dreamed of being a mother since I was a child. Like I didn't know if I ever wanted to have kids. Mm-hmm. Um and and so motherhood was not then and still is not. The, my most natural state. And it's not super easy for me. Um, I love my son to death and like cannot imagine my life without him. And he brings me so much happiness and so much joy, but it's a challenge for me every single day. It's um, really hard. I mean, even for people who, who wanted kids, it's <laughs> really freaking hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not the easiest thing. And, um, and so I felt really kind of lost after having him like, and seeing so many Um, my best friend, Anna is like a very natural mother. She's very nurturing and caring and she has all the patience in the world. And I felt so lost. Mm -hmm. I felt like I, I felt like I had spent my entire life being Megan and now I was Gray's mom. Right. (sighs) Like I wasn't Megan anymore. And that was really, really, really hard for me. Um, and especially to my, my ex-husband is very successful. And so to also, um, you know, see him and I was so proud of him and so excited for him and so glad I could support him and his work. But it's also really hard to be like, here's, you know, here's Nathan and he's and Nate's wife. 
Yeah. Right. And I'm Nate's wife and I'm Gray's mom. Right. Like I had right. no identity of my own. And it was so hard. And so when I started weaving and was like actually kind of good at it, and it was so exciting for me every day to like, I mean, I would like put Gray down for a nap and like be laying down with him, um, like nursing him or something. And it's like my all I could think about was like all these things I wanted to try. It was like my brain was just exploding with creativity and ideas in a way that I hadn't used my brain in mm-hmm. years. I love and that. I, I totally understand that. And I, I love that. It was, it was like so fulfilling. It was, it was like something that like, like just couldn't be held inside of me mm-hmm. any longer. Like there's and no choice. There's no choice but to pursue it. Exactly. Exactly. And I didn't, and I mean, especially when I first started, um, I didn't see it as, I never imagined, I, certainly when I first started, I never imagined that this was going to be what I was going to be doing. Um, I, you know, it was definitely like, oh, I'm going to make some stuff. I mean, like, this is what everyone's getting for Christmas and their birthdays. From right. <laughs> Whether or not they ask for it, this is what they're getting. <laughs> exactly. So it was like, sorry, guys. <laughs> yep. um, and so I... You know, at first, and and part of that though too is because I was learning a craft. I mean, at that point, I wasn't creating anything that wasn't already out there. You know what I mean? Right. It was like I was very much like, oh, I want to make a weaving with triangles and fringe. Like, there's, you know, all there's a lot of other people doing that. Like, right. it's beautiful and it looks nice, and I'm learning how to do this so that, um, you know, my salvages are straight. And like, I was learning a craft, but I definitely wasn't making anything like unique. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my own voice is right. what it comes down to. Um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, I didn't ever see it really that way. And when we came back to California after being in Arizona, um, makeshift society, this really great co-working space, um, in San Francisco contacted me and said, would you come and teach a class? And, because I taught nutrition classes before I was like, okay, I know how to teach ish. Like I'm not like a teacher teacher, but I'm like, I can, I can totally do this. How did they know um, you existed at this point? Is, is this through Instagram? Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is bad. I mean, Instagram was still like fairly unpopulated mm-hmm. at this point compared to now, you know, I mean, now it's like crazy, but, right. um, and there weren't tons of people yet doing like weaving was starting to get exciting and people were wanting to do it but there weren't a lot of teachers yet either Mm -hmm. and so um and so when they contacted me I was like okay and I thought to myself okay I'm gonna teach one class if I hate it I never have to do it again you know it was like if I crash and burn if nobody knows how to weave at the end of this like (laughs) I never have to do it again right and I learned a lot like each class I taught especially that first year I learned a ton about like, I mean, that first class I taught, I taught them so much stuff and it was so insane. And, and it's like, no, let, and and now the class that I do teach when I teach is like so easy and basic because I want people to have time to have creativity and not right. just be learning skill after skill, after skill, after skill, because I don't like, if you're t- taking a workshop, I think it's more fun to be able to just like have some space to enjoy it mm-hmm. and not just let and me teach you as many things as possible. <laughs> totally. And actually to like finish a project while you're there right. and exactly. not have it feel incredibly rushed like you have to master all these techniques before you leave. Exactly. Yeah. And like, and it's like stuff like when I took my Navajo weaving class, um, that class was, I don't know, we'll say, I think it was four or six weeks long. So it was like one Saturday, it was every Saturday morning for like three or four hours. And even when I finished that class, I had like this much, I mean, I had like eight inches of a weaving done because it's, right. I mean, that weaving is very time consuming. Um, but it was like each week she would just teach us like one thing and then we would work on that one skill for like that four hours. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, I think it's great to have these workshops that, are, you know, people can come and learn something, but um, I think it's managing what's realistic and what you're actually going to take out of it and mm-hmm. get, you know, um, when you go home and then if you're actually going to want to do it again. <laughs> right, um, right. So I've been trying to like that kind of changed, but that first class, it was great. And I ended up having an incredible class of students. And I would say of that, I think there were 12 students in my first 12 or 14. That's a lot. A, That's a lot for a first yeah. class. Oh my gosh. It was a, yeah. I mean, in hindsight, I learned a lot, <laughs> Right. <laughs> but, um, sink or I swim would, of that class, I probably still talked to eight people that took that <gasps> That's so awesome. Like, and I mean, not all the time, but it's like we see each other around and like, you know, they were all kind of artists. And so it was really incredible. It was a really, um, it was great. And 
and so from there, you know, I started teaching a bit. And then a few months after that was the first time I used roving. Um, but it was at the end of 2014 that I really started playing with roving more. Mm -hmm. And then 2015 is when everything changed. Um, um, how did you think to start use to, to, uh, to start using roving? Did, is it something you'd seen other people use in tapestries or is it because you'd had this experience, um, you know, with, with agriculture and fibers in that sense? Um, so when it, I, basically what happened was I went to the yarn store, I went to a verb for keeping warm here in Oakland and, um, I'm looking around for different material, you know, like, Oh, what yarns? What? And cause I, a lot of people have plans, they paint, they do all kinds of stuff before they start a weaving. Mm -hmm. I've never been like that. Um, <clears throat> or very rarely have I been like that. Mostly I would go in and I'd be like, I really love this yarn. I'm going to buy it and then figure out what I'm going to do with it. Right. Um, and, and so I was in a verb for keeping warm and I looked over and I saw this basket of roving and I was like, what is that? Squishy. Like, that's <laughs> beautiful and amazing. And I was like, I'm going to buy some of this stuff. This is so cool. Um, at that point, I had never once seen anybody use roving in anything. And I know it had been done um, before me. Like there's stuff from like the 70s where people right. were using roving. It's not like it's not like I'm the first person on earth to use roving, but I had not seen it at mm -hmm. that point. Like, I'd never seen a weaving with it. Um, and I just like I bought some of it and um, and I went home and I was just like, OK, what should I do with this? And um, and so I started weaving with it. Um, and I, I mean, you know, you learn as you go, like the first few things I did probably have not held up great, I would guess over time, um, just because of the way I was using it. Um, but what was really funny is like the day that I posted the first time that I was using roving the exact same day, Marianne Moody and one other person, and now I cannot remember who it was also posted roving weavings. Wow. A full it roving of, with nothing, with no roving. other. Wow. Yeah. And it was so bizarre. Like, it was like this like group think mentality thing yeah. that was like universe. Um, and so it was really interesting that like at the same day, we were all like kind of in the same place. And then, um, you know, and then months went by, I wasn't really using roving very much. Um, like I would use it here and there. Um, and then it was, so one of the things about roving, of course, is that it weaves very quickly because it's a giant material. Um, and so what had happened was then um, I applied for West Coast Craft, which is this big art design fair mm -hmm. um, here in San Francisco. And I had applied and I got accepted and I had never done anything like this. And I was exhilarated and terrified. And um, I... So I had like, I found out in like June or something that I was going to be in this thing in December. And so I'd started like making some stuff. And then, um, that fall in September or end of August, beginning of September, my dad got sick and, um, we didn't really know, you know, it was like, they couldn't really figure out what was wrong with him. He was in the hospital. Um, and then, uh, I got a call one morning and they said, they said, there's a possibility that it's pancreatic cancer. And I was like, I'm on a plane tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And because my parents didn't want me to come. They're like, no, no, no. Like, as I kept saying, I was like, I want to come. And they and so then I was like, you can't tell me no now. I'm coming tomorrow. Like, I have to be there. And and we found out, like, when I got there that it was pancreatic cancer. Oh, wow. um, and um, it was already stage four. And so they told us that he probably, with chemo and everything, he'd probably have nine months to a year to live. Um, and so I uh, basically I was like, okay. Um, I was like, I have West coast craft in December and like, I had some other things like leading up to it that I had like committed to in California. I said, but as soon as West coast craft is done, I was like, gray and I are moving to Michigan to live there for the rest of my dad's life. Like yeah. that was our plan was that we were just going to go. I like got a preschool for gray. I mean like everything. And, and the plan was that Nate would like come back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and so I was in Michigan for a little bit when we first found out his diagnosis, I came back to California um, and within four weeks, my dad died. Oh my gosh. And, and I was, I was very, very close with my father. Um, and so it was, it was just awful and heartbreaking. And so then I had to go back to Michigan and Gray was with me and thankful for our friend Dima. She, mm -hmm. her, she like helped out so much with Gray and that's the preschool. Like we, well, I was in Michigan. Gray was in preschool with her son. I mean, it was like this whole thing. Um, and like basically two weeks after my father died, I realized that our, my marriage was ending. Like there was, it was, 
just not going to work anymore. Um, and, uh, so, you know, kind of a lot of loss happening all at once. Right. Right. All at once. It's, it's per- and, really intense. It was, yeah. And so it was about a month that I was kind of back and forth in Michigan. I got back to California in November. It was like November 10th or something. And I was like, West Coast Craft is in less than a month. And I have like three things made for this. And I was just, and I had used roving. And so then I was like, okay, maybe I'll get a bunch of roving and make some of these weavings. Like, I really like them. They look cool. And I can like weave pretty quickly with them. And so I went and got a bunch of roving and started doing it. And it, felt so good to work with that material because my body was just like traumatized. You know, mm-hmm. it was like I was going through so much internally and like feeling so horrible that it was like this thing that was so tactile and so soft and so wonderful. And when you work with it, it's like, it's not like with yarn where you can just like, whap, you know, wrap it around um, a, a shed stick. It's like, it was like, you I had to get in it. I had to get in it and like every single millimeter is passing through my fingers. Right. And, and so, it's like one big hug. It Rov- is like Rov- if you, for those of you listening. If you haven't u- used roving yet, go for it because it's go, so go incredible. <laughs> it's so beautiful, and so that was I started using it, and it was so healing. It like made me feel so much better. And then basically, that's I just like dove into that world of it, and mm. then uh, and I think that was like, and because I wasn't weaving anymore in a traditional way, I like created this own like. I just started like letting the, the fiber speak to me. I wasn't like, it wasn't like over, under, over, under, over, under, beat, 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 beat. It was like, you're going to go here and you're going to go here. And it was this like organic movement that like, just like let my body do what it needed to do. Um, and so it was, it was really, um, it just like really changed then to go from this thing that was like learning, learning, learning to then like all of a sudden creating. Right. Um, and so I think that's where things like that was when things changed was that that time in my life was when everything and deciding to leave my husband. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I had had this cushy life of, you know, he was our uh, the breadwinner. And, right. and uh, then all of a sudden it was like, uh, OK, figure I, out where to go. Now you got to <laughs> go rent a place and get yourself like, situated. <laughs> And I um, don't really have a real job. And, you know, like hadn't, I mean, I was making minimal amount of money at that point, you know, like right. I was in selling a little bit of work, but it was like all of a sudden sink or swim. Right. So did West Coast Craft happen before or after you moved out? Because what I'm imagining is West Coast Craft happens, everyone sees your roving pieces and the handmade weaving community kind of goes nuts <laughs> over it, Right. Um, well, so basically when, when I realized that my marriage wasn't going to work anymore, I basically said to my ex, I I said, look, like, I I can't see a way that this is like going to work. And, um, I was like, but I was like, I have West Coast craft in a month. Um, so we're not even going to talk about it until after that's done, Mm -hmm. because I was like, I need to focus on my career and that's more important to me right now. Um, like the stuff that's happening with us can wait because it's whatever. And so Um, and so even after West Coast Craft, it took about another month before I left him. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, when you've been with somebody for nine years or what, eight, nine years, it's, 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 you, it's hard to just walk out the door one day. Um, and, and so, um, it, you know, it took us some time and it was actually, cause I kept like going back and forth about it in my head because, um, I mean, I was raised Catholic and my parents went through hard times and stayed together through everything. And, um, and I, I really thought that I was supposed to make this relationship work, mm-hmm. um, and, and wanted to, I mean, you know, I didn't want to walk away from somebody who I, um, who I loved. And, um, and I went to, um, in, at the time there was a fiber art show happening, um, uh, in Boston at the ICA in Boston. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I mean, like every, you know, so many fiber artists that I just love and were, had this beautiful exhibit there. And, um, and so I went there for like 24 hours, like flew to Boston, went to the show and like got on a plane and went back to Michigan because we were in Michigan for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, uh, I went just to go see that. And I think that was when I started to think like, maybe I could do this. Like maybe I could be a person who 
in 40 years has my work in a right. museum, you know, in, in a beautiful gallery, in a beautiful museum. Like maybe I can be a part of a show like this one right. day. Um, in 40 and, years. How about one year <laughs> or like six months? <laughs> well, you know, this was also like three and a half years ago. Um, but I mean, even still, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not where those people are, but, um, uh, you know, it, it was just like all of a sudden, like, oh, maybe I could really do this. Like, yeah. And, and even if I'm not one of them, maybe if I'm not one of the greats, like, why not at least try, you know, like why, why limit myself right. to, know. Um, and, and so I think that was like what really gave me the confidence in myself to take that leap Mm -hmm. into really seeing myself and like that I'm going to create things and Mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm going to do this instead of just, um, I don't know, uh, making some things for my mom. Like that it can be so much more than a hobby and that it can be your life, your, your livelihood and what, and what you do because you love it and, and make your mark in it. So, yeah, yeah. Did you go on that trip? Did you go on that trip to Boston alone? Yeah. That's awesome. Just having that time to think alone and like, you know, it was so great. It wasn't with you and, you know, yeah. 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 And I stayed in like a nice hotel, which was like something I don't, I mean, now I try to do that because I hate, I, I, I always want to sleep in my own bed. And so when I travel now, I always try to like at least stay in nice places because it makes the traveling not as difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, but back then it was always like, whatever's the cheapest. Right, you know? right. So that was like quite a treat to to go, you know, on this place, on, on this trip by myself too, after like going through like just losing my dad and like all this stuff to like have 24 hours alone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's in a lot of ways, those times that we give ourselves to be completely alone with ourselves, um, is, those are the life changing moments where you have your ideas and they you can really listen to your own head. You know, right. listen to your own heart and what, what you're like, I feel like our bodies are trying to constantly tell us stuff and we just can't listen to it because there's too much happening. You know? Right. Well, if, especially like when you have, you know, you have a job or you have a, a, you know, partner, you have kids or mm-hmm. you have friends or you're constantly stuck to your phone right. or exactly. It's, like, it's so hard to just make quiet time for yourself and, and not have something else external happening. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, uh, there was something I was, oh, so, I mean, cause my, even my, my, uh, journey to finding weaving was similar in a sense that like I took a trip alone for the first time since having kids and that's when the ideas came. So yeah, that's just something I wanted to quickly touch upon just, you know, for the people listening that, um, you know, that I feel like that is one of those things that you can do if you're feeling stuck creatively or, um, you know, you need some inspiration is just take alone time. Yeah. That's kind of, it's so yeah. important. Yeah. And even just like, if you can't get out of town, like where I used to live at my old house before I moved here, um, I lived, um, in the woods basically. And so anytime if I was just kind of stuck or in a rut or just kind of like the, you know, I would just go for a quick hike, like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, it didn't even have to be a big deal. Um, and almost always I would come back like re-energized or refocused or have a new idea or, you know, whatever it would like just getting out of like the zone of everything being encroaching around you, you know? Right, right. And your own four walls, you know, which you're so used to seeing. You're seeing the same thing all the time. So it's like you just get out there and get into nature or wherever you live, you know, go Mm -hmm. to a museum and see other pieces of art. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, So now what is your, what is your creative process like? Um, Do you have a plan going in nowadays? And I guess it probably depends on the project, but. um, Yeah. (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of, it depends, certainly. Um, I think, I mean, generally, so I do, I do a lot kind of, um, I do a lot of commission work. Like that's basically like my bread and butter is like working with people on commissions. Um, and so a lot of times like somebody will have seen my work in the past or seen certain pieces or colors or, or like they might see like a style that they like, and then they contact me and they're like, here, I like this style, but you know, here's some colors or whatever that I want to work with. Um, and so like those are a little bit more planned out because I'm working with somebody to create something special for their home. So like that stuff is generally, there's more direction at least going into it. Um, I have found that, um, so like there's that kind of thing. And then, but then when I'm doing work on my own, um, generally I'll just start by, (laughs) 
I'll show you. Actually, I'm like looking at this. Um, th- here's my creative process. Can you see the roving on the floor? <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so basically what I'll do is I'll go to my shelves and I'll start pulling off colors that I'm like feeling and I just pile them all up on the floor. Um, and sometimes they all get in. Sometimes some of them do. Sometimes I end up like starting back over and you know those guys those go back um but that's kind of how it starts is just like if I'm just weaving for myself it'll just be kind of like what colors do I want to start with um and then I'll start to do kind of you know different things like it was actually interesting a few weeks ago I posted a a weaving that um I I was working for a commission for this guy who had seen the weaving side done for the assembly which is this place in San Francisco and the colors that the assembly chose were just like incredible. And I've made tons of stuff now based off of those colors because they were so great. And so this man, Gonzalo, had seen those pieces and he was like, I want something like that, but I want it bigger. I was like, okay, cool. And I started doing it and I started doing these kind of um, like the colors, like really interacting a lot with each other. And I was so into that weaving and it wasn't exactly what he and I had discussed. So when I sent him the picture of it, I was like, Hey, I know this is different than like what we had talked about. Like if you're not into it, it's totally fine because I will keep this weaving. And like, I was so into it. Mm-hmm. I was just like, wow, I haven't been this into something in a while. Right, like, that's the best so feeling. And he was like, no, I love it. And I was like, okay, like <laughs> I'm glad you love it, but like also kind of bummed. Yeah. Like, totally. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so then, um, like, that's the thing I'm kind of doing now. And I posted it the other day of another one. I was like, oh, okay, I guess these, it's like, kind of, it's very like vaginal. Right, like it's right. very like, and I'm like, but I'm super into it. And then, so I was making one last week that was going to be for me to go above my bed and, um, a friend contact or like this woman who's an acquaintance of mine contacted me and she was like, Hey, um, I really want to get something from you. Um, I've been saving up money, like, cause I've known her now for about a year and she's like, I've been saving up money. Like, what do you have right now? And so I like took pictures of stuff that I have here that I haven't listed on my website or whatever and that one wasn't even finished and she's like I want that one and so I was like damn it <laughs> like I'm so excited people want to buy my work right but I'm like but I'm like I wanted to put one over my bed because <laughs> um, you can see I have a blank wall this is my bed that I'm sitting in right now well, it's um, that it's that thing that the cobbler's children never don't have shoes right exactly. you know? <laughs> that's how my okay. place is as well like this is the one behind me is the only one I and it's one of two that I have. But yeah, well, it's like everything else I have is like I have piles of stuff because I'm like I need to photograph this stuff and get on my website. But it's not stuff that and like I love all of it, but it's like, you know, there's certain things that you're just like, Oh, I really like want this or like that one was like the size was gonna like fill this up, yes, you know? Yeah. Um and so I feel like that's the thing that I've been kind of working on right now that I'm super into. I like, love them. Um, I, I know you posted it and you were like, uh, more vaginas? <laughs> like, yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah, we need more of these. Um, so that's been something I've been working on. Um, another project I'm working on that I'm really also excited about that I haven't posted about yet, but I will be soon. Um, I And I got really exciting news about it this week. Um, I had started working on kind of a series of weavings. Um, that all of the profits from them, I'm going to be donating back to um, to the children in Flint who have been poisoned by the the water crisis. Right, the Flint water crisis, yeah. Um, and so I've been, and so right now I think I have like maybe seven weavings to donate to it, um, or where all of the the profits will be donated to it. Um, and so I, I, and this is going to be kind of like an ongoing project. So like, I want to continually work on this and always kind of have some, uh, some things available or, you know, I'll release like a collection at a time or whatever mm-hmm. with you. Um, but so it's something I've been kind of working on, um, in my like spare time or free time or when I'm feeling like needing to do something for me. Um, and I, I was talking to some friends from Flint on Facebook last week and one of my friends owns a gallery. You, you, you do you know Mike Nadeo? Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, yeah. A- Sarah's husband. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, he has a gallery in Flint. And so he asked me to come this fall and make a collection of work that we're going to show at the oh, gallery. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't even know he had a gallery. That's I so didn't cool. either. He's yeah. had it for about a year. Um, and mm. so I... It'll He's be my clearly first- not posting it on Facebook enough. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> Um, but so yeah, he invited me to have a show there this fall. That's so awesome! So, Congrats! Uh, it'll be my first time in Flint showing work. Like I wanna, so, that I want to go so, back and like when you're when you have the opening, I want to go back for it. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, it'll either be in September, or October. Okay, so cool. 
I get to decide which one works for me. So, um, but I'm, I'm just so honored and like thrilled about it. And it's, it's something that is like, um, I guess to kind of back up a little, I've, I've been kind of going through this weird, like crisis as an artist or like midlife crisis or whatever, um, of like, what am I doing and why am I doing this and whatever. And I realized that part of it is that like, I haven't, like, I'm not a, the kind of act, I used to be an activist who would like go out and protest things and like do all of that stuff. And I did that in my early twenties and stuff. And it's much more difficult for me now. And a lot of that is like, I don't love crowds. It right. makes me really anxious. Um, well, I, and especially with uh, what's going on and I just, it's just, yeah, it, there's more, uh, it's just more dangerous to be out there. I feel. Yeah. That and, and like, just like more than anything though, it's my own like anxiety about like um, it's hard for me to just like be in crowds. And I, and, and so I, um, but I want to be able to do things. And it's like, how can I do things like, and, and like, I want to use my platform, but then I also don't want to be this hypocrite who's like saying things, but not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is the one power that I have. If I, if I have a platform to sell my work and people want to buy my work, I can certainly donate Mm -hmm. money um, back to important causes. And because it's one thing to use your voice loudly in, you know, public setting and to be a body showing up, but like, if I can't, if that's really hard for me to do, like, let me try another way that I can, I can do something. And so, so this is something that's like a really important thing to me. And so I thought, Hey, this is something I can actually do. And, and so it's already helping me to feel a little bit more grounded in my life and like, want, you know, what can I do and why is the work that I'm doing even important or better? Right. I mean, Um, you feel more purposeful or purpose driven in, in what you're doing, which is wonderful. Yeah. So trying to get back to that because I've this year has been a weird year for me. So. <laughs> well, well, actually, so this I'm sorry, this sort of brings me back because I, I cut you off when we were talking about the journey from oh, so from no. going to, you know, from going from um, uh, like what that first West Coast craft to the steps that have happened or maybe like the, the pivotal moments that have happened since then to get you to where you are now. So I guess that kind of that kind of brings us back. Um so you were going through so much in your life at that point. Um, what did that, so what did that look like af- afterward or, um, you know, as you were building your art practice, how, how did that, what did that look like? Um, well, the, the first year was, was really, really tough. Um, you know, in 2015, um, it was, I felt like, uh, I was just kind of spinning. Like mm-hmm. I, um, all of a sudden I was a single mom. I had, I had my son most of the time he saw his, he saw his dad every other weekend. Um, which means he saw his dad four days a month. Like when you put that into like, when I realized that that's all it was, it's like, right. that's so hard on a child to go from living with both parents to like only seeing his dad four days a month. Right. Um, and so I was going through all this stuff. I was like single mom. Um, trying to, you know, trying to make a dollar, um, and feeling like my life was just like, I didn't even know what my life had become. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, trying to just kind of survive it, you know? Um, and, and I don't want to like, so many people go through this stuff. Like this isn't, I, I'm not this like unique flower or something that like, I'm the only person who's gone through this hard time, but when you're in it, you're in it. Mm -hmm. And like, and, and, you know, so many other things are happening in the world, but like, you're just kind of like, you're just trying to get through your day to day life. Um, and so I think at the time, especially I was just feeling really like artwork helped to keep me grounded. Like Mm -hmm. weaving was like something I could do. And I was making something and I was doing something and it felt like, and people liked what I was doing, which like at the time also I needed some confidence, I think and getting, you know, positive feedback was just like, Whew, okay, thank you. You know, like getting that from the universe, like felt really good because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was going to do. Like, am I going to move back in with my mom? Like, I didn't know, you know, mm-hmm. I was, I was terrified. Um, and so, um, it was, it was a really hard and scary time. And then, you know, it was like each day you build a little bit more and things get a little better and easier. Um, and then eventually, um, I decided to move over here to Oakland. Um, and this was a little over two years ago. And, um, it was a big decision because I was leaving the place I lived for five years and, um, and, you know, it was a big change and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, 
it was great. Um, I don't know. I mean, it was, there's things that I miss about my old house, but I love living in Oakland. I feel yeah. like, you know, closer to people, closer to things and, um, and living in the place where I live, it, it's allowed me to make much bigger work and, and like be accessible to a lot more things that are happening in the Bay area. Um, and, uh, now Grace uses his dad a lot more cause his dad lives 10 minutes from us. So oh, that's great. Yeah. So we split custody yeah. now. So like now I actually have more time to, you know, focus on my artwork. Um, and it's a, it's a win-win cause he sees his dad more and you get more time. <laughs> right. Exactly. And his dad, you know, so it's like for all of us, um, I mean, I wish I could have, you know, I wish I could have gray every day. Like, you know, I would love that, but I also, I think it's very important for him to have his father and, and it is like, there's no way I can make work the way that I do mm-hmm. if I had gray full time, like there would just not happen. Um, so you know, I think like that's become, you know, a a new thing that has helped and changed a lot. Um, but I'm really like that first year I learned so much about myself, I think Mm -hmm. especially, and, and also having to go from, again, I was Gray's mom and I was Nate's wife. And now all of a sudden I had to figure out who was Megan, you know, the last three and a half years, like that was, that's been a big thing is like morphing myself back into, and because I'm not, when I met my ex-husband, I was 26. So I'm not that Megan anymore for sure. Right, right. <laughs> so it, it's like, you know, now being 38 and like, you know, being a really different person and, um, you know, being at this part, point in my life, it's, it's a really different experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. It's just been a... No, yeah, definitely. Well, I was thinking, you know what, what prompted me to ask that I was, I was thinking about your, um, a couple of the shows I remember back when I first started following you, um, which was around when I started weaving, which was around 2015. Yeah. Um, so I think it was Rove. It might yeah. have been Rove where you made the cocoon piece. Is that what yeah. that show, yeah. what, what that piece was for? Um, so yeah. I was just thinking about how it translated what was happening in your life and how, uh, how it was a kind of therapy, um, and sort of a safe, and you were creating safe spaces for yourself. Yes. Um, yeah, um, I could talk about Rove forever. That was, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, y- you know, back earlier in our conversation, how I talked about that woman who was in Seattle who was having the pop up and asked for some of my pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, so, right before my father died, she had, con- or right after my father had died, she had contacted me, or I don't know when exactly it was. She contacted me and she said, Hey, so that gallery that I work with, um, I was thinking, would you want to have a solo show there? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I do. I would love to. Um, and so at the time we were talking about just having like wall hangings, whatever. And, um, and she, she had like emailed me and then it took me, you know, a little bit to get back to her. And, um, and then I, you know, I wrote to her and I was just like, Hey, I was like, I'm sorry. Like my dad just died. I'm like, go, I'm like leaving my husband or whatever. I was like, I'm going through kind of a lot, like, sorry for like the delay in response or whatever, you know, and she was like, and and she was just like, can we get on the phone? And I was like, okay. And so we talked and she's like, what would you think about having, she's like, what if we wait, have the show later? And like, cause we were initially, we we're going to have it in like February or March. And she's like, what if we pushed it back and have the show later in the year? Um, and like really explored what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. And she's an amazing curator because like, I think the job of curators is like, you are the one who, yes, like I have the creativity of like, producing the work, but they're the ones who pull it out Mm -hmm. of you. You know, they're like, but what about if we did something like this? Or what if you changed this thing or whatever? Um, and that is what she did. And I went to Seattle, um, that May, um, to meet with her and to see, cause by then at that point, she decided that we were going to have the show concurrently at two galleries. And one, um, was going to be at one gallery. We were going to have, um, a performance piece. And then, and like, this is before we even had talked about the cocoon, but she was like, we'll have it at two galleries at the same time. And she had all these ideas. And so we get there and I go and we look at the galleries and then we go back to her house and we're like, and I'm teaching her how to weave and we're like drinking wine and eating cheese. And, and so we're talking about like the whole thing. And she's like, well, what about like these different things that you could like explore, like different feeling. And like, she just like, we just talked and she like was pulling all this stuff out of me. And so I basically went home and started like, thinking about all the different things that I wanted to make and what those pieces of the feelings that were like the big feelings that I was going through and how they would translate into 
the woven work or right. the, the sculptures or whatever. And, um, and we had decided on the cocoon, I think when I was, or we had started talking about it and I got back and asked my carpenter friend to create this, this base for it. And so he got to work on that right away. And, um, and then I started, and so the, the pieces, so there was like the cocoon, which is like a pretty literal, like, you know, caterpillar going in, emerging a butterfly, you know, like this kind of like Phoenix reborn from the ashes, like just a transformation of self, you know, mm-hmm. that you go through during this time. And then I had, um, the wave piece, which was about like the waves of feelings that you go through and like things being, you know, hard, messy and hard and, and then things feeling like they're getting better and then things are still really loose and you don't know where they're going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, there was abundance because I had, incredible friends who helped me get through this time. I mean, I can't, I could never thank them enough for what they did for me and and how they showed up for me. And then, and also getting, going from, again, like not really having, not knowing if this was going to work as an artist and having so much support from the community. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I had um, uh, the piece called separation and it had like strands holding the two pieces together. And it felt like part was my old life and this was my new life. And there's just like strands that are holding it together. Like it's a really different, it's two different pieces now, you know, there's like before and the after. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there was the piece called bound, which I went on to make a lot more work. And I've talked about this a lot and, um, and thought about this concept a lot of what we bind ourselves to in the world. Um, because I, I mean, even now I still think it's really interesting that like you get to choose, what you bind yourself to. And we often bind ourselves to things that are not great, toxic, uh, unimportant, but then we're so wrapped up into it that Mm -hmm. it's hard to, to unlink yourself from it. Um, and so it's kind of like, what are the things that you actually need to be bound to? What are the things that are actually important in the world? Um, and, and so like that was, you know, for me, that was obviously like, I had bound myself to like this relationship and this idea of myself and all of that. And then having to be like, what do I actually want and what do I want to bind myself to going forward and trying to just be more, I guess, like conscious of what, what you're binding yourself to. Uh, And how do you detach and then make that pathway to the, to what you should be going to toward? Exactly. And then continually continuing to bind yourself to things that like I dated this guy for a long time. That was like not a good person for me at all, but I got so wrapped into it. Um, And it was so hard to let go, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and even though I could say to myself, like, this isn't good, this is not good. And it was like, but, (laughs) you know, Um, and and, I mean, we've all been in that situation at some point or another in our lives. Um, And, you know, so it's, it's definitely like having to, to figure that out. Like, what are we consciously doing this to, to ourselves? Um, Yeah, it's like, and you have to reprogram you really have to like reprogram your brain to react differently to things or go toward things that um, that activate that frontal lobe that makes you want it. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. So it really is. It's almost like it's almost like reprogramming or find, you know finding new habits, new healthier habits that make you do healthier things and make better decisions for yourself. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I don't know if you know Jessica Lenyado. She's um she's like an intuitive counselor here in the Bay Area. She's an astrologer. She's a medium. She's incredible. And um and she said something about how the universe will continue to throw the same situation at you over and over and over again until you learn your lesson and act differently. Mm-hmm. And I think about that a lot, especially after like finally, finally getting myself out of that that bad relationship. And then seeing what the universe has given to me in the last few months and being like, oh, interesting. Huh. Okay. You're giving me that again to see if I'm going to take the bait, you know? Right. Uh, And so it's, it's definitely like an interesting thing to think about how, like, I do kind of believe that in the, in a concept that you'll continue to make the same mistakes until you Mm. actually make the choice to stop making them to say, oh, I see this pattern emerging. Right. (laughs) Let me go this way instead. You have (laughs) to break, you have to like break the chain. Of, right. of thought or whatever it is that, you know, that binds you to it, you know? Right, right, exactly. So, um, yeah, so I think, I mean, that show for me was just like life changing and, and it was working on the pieces where oh, it was so great. Um, when I came back from that show, I got pretty depressed because I was like, it was done. The, yeah. The come down from it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was really hard. And I think, I think, 
I was not, I didn't know that that was ever going to happen. I didn't know that was going to happen. And so were, was were you on site working on it? Um, yeah. Oh God, that's even, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I made most of the pieces and shipped them up there, but the cocoon I couldn't make until I got there. Cause we had the, my carpenter was in Michigan. So he shipped oh. the cocoon, the wooden um, structure of it to Seattle. I so I couldn't, I couldn't start working on it till I got to Seattle. Wow. Um, and of course, because I'm an insane person, I never like really give myself like a normal amount of time to do things. So I think from the time I got to Seattle until like the time the show was opening, I don't, I mean, I probably had three days or something to do that whole thing, which is like, wow. <laughs> I mean, total marathon. Did you even sleep? Or like just go straight through with adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, I slept for sure, but it was definitely like it. It was really hot. I remember it being really hot. <laughs> like that's what I remember about that. Um, I mean, it was just insane. Like how, um, and it was the same thing when I had my show in Paris, which was also incredible um, in 2016. Um, but I didn't. I got to Paris on Saturday night, and the show opened on Thursday, and I had to make all of the work for it. Oh my because god, that time. <laughs> That's insane. Is that be also because of just like logistically shipping wouldn't be possible or? Well, the artist that I collaborated with, the um, Anais Giri, who's a, she's an indigo dyer, an indigo artist and dyer. Um, she, I had all the roving was there and she had to dye it. And so oh. I had to all dye before I got there. Um, and so it wouldn't have made sense for it to be dyed in France, shipped to California, me to ship all the work. Right. It was like, okay, I just got to get there and make it. Wow. <laughs> But so people will say, oh, what did you do in Paris? Like, can you give me recommendations? I'm like, uh, work. <laughs> You're like, I only know this one place that I stayed in and never left. And like, I mean, my, my, my the people in France, all the people who collaborated on this project and, you know, like they would take me out for food and stuff. I, I didn't have any, like, right. say, you know, and they were amazing. And, and of, I mean, it's France. So like everything's incredible, but, and you're in Paris. So like life is perfect, but, um, you know, it it was definitely, it wasn't, I wasn't sightseeing. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, that's the best thing though, because I feel like when you get a chance to create work in a different environment and, and with the pressure of it behind it, it you're creating different work than you would have created in your own studio, Absolutely. you know, with a different energy and, I, and with a different sort of translation, you know? Yeah. And I need a deadline. Otherwise, mm -hmm. man, I am lazy. Oh God, me too. I feel you on that girl. <laughs> If you don't put a fire under my butt, like nothing is going to get done ever. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I feel you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, okay, so where are you now with this? You were you mentioned briefly. Uh, so what's been going on with the past couple months? Um, what's going on in your life? Um, well, um, like I said, I got I finally got excited again about this show that's I'm going to do in Flint and like making this water these water um, pieces or you know this kind of this, these benefit pieces. Um, I'm really excited about that. Um, I, um, well, tonight I'm speaking on a panel in San Francisco and I've been getting asked to do kind of more like interviews, podcasts, um, speaking on panels, which I'm finding that I'm really, really enjoying, um, and would love to do more of this kind of thing. Um, not only cause I love to talk about myself, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, I really enjoy listening to this stuff from other people. Yes, like I love, I agree. That is like and the whole I reason love, I'm doing it. Yeah. Like I love listening to other people's stories and I find it so fascinating. Um, and, and so, um, and I think especially, and, and I think right now we're in this like really interesting time in history where women have a voice like they've never had before. Um, and and people want to hear from women and mm -hmm. want to know what, how women are, are doing what they're doing and women are really supporting each other. Um, and so I'm really, it makes me really excited and really happy that this is happening. Um, and so, and I've been thinking a lot about like the, the panel that I'm on tonight is there's a, we're watching a documentary called artist and mother mm -hmm. and, um, the co-producer of the documentary is going to be there as well. And, um, she followed four female or four mother artists, um, and kind of like talked about their journey and, and in the art world, a lot of times once you become a mother, um, you're not taken as seriously. Um, there can be a lot of like reper repercussions and like what your work is or like in the fine arts, like what they see. And, and so all of that can be damaging. And, and I know personally, I, against being a person who didn't even know if I wanted to be a mother, um, there's a big struggle that I have is 
and especially being a single mother, like I don't, I don't have any help. Mm -hmm. Um, like if there is an art show tonight, it's like, well, okay, then I have to get a babysitter. Um, and that is a huge expense that I don't often have, you know, the funds to indulge in. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's like, there's a lot of stuff that I miss because of that. And, and, you know, yeah, I can take my seven year old, but like, or he's almost seven. Um, but you know, especially like on a Friday after he's been in school all week and I'm picking him from school and I know because yeah, he's been I... on the ground, he's going to be covered in dirt. And now I'm going to get him in the car and drive an hour to San Francisco. To right, go to and he's an probably going to be really tired and a little bit grumpy and be a monster. Let's, yeah. let's be a, give me a monster. He's not <laughs> I was be trying a to be monster. nice, but. <laughs> he's gonna be a monster I love you great but he's gonna be a monster so like so you know not like I don't want to do that and I don't want to do it to him and I don't want to do it to you know other people um and so you know there's a lot of things that I miss out on because of it um, yeah. um or feel like then I I want to be there to support my friend and their thing and I'm like but I can't and like yeah. that feels that feels hard sometimes um well there's a or- lot of FOMO but then there's also just the yeah, the, the the logistical reality of ha- having a kid, you know, um, that there's just you can't. First of all, like you don't have enough time to do everything, and exactly. there's so many probably so many ideas in your head that you want to execute. That just you know, just the reality is like, where is that time? You know, right, right, and it's it's hard because then and then there's like I do most of my weaving at night. Like I'll stay up all night long and and weave, um, and I'll do that sometimes when Gray is here. Um, the mornings really suck because if I don't go to bed until like four and then he's up at six, I'm just, Oh God. It's rough. The worst. Uh, but, um, but it, it like that stuff too is like this, it's like a challenge. And so, I mean, you know, and, and I certainly don't want to sound like I'm complaining because I'm not, it's just a challenge. Like of we course. all, you know, we all have different things, especially, um, you know, when you have different responsibilities, it's, it's like, you know, you can't, can't always do your art the minute you want to do your art, you know? Of um, course. And, um, and so, uh, so, I mean, it's a thing that I've been thinking about a lot this year. Um, I kind of mentioned briefly before we started recording that, um, like I've really taken a step back from teaching this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there was, there's been, there were a few reasons for it. Um, basically though, I had to, um, I, something had to give, I was at this point at the end of last year. Um, so I have my, I have gray half time, but so it's like two weekends a month. I don't have him. And so it was like all of last year, one weekend a month, I was traveling to teach somewhere. And so then I would have one weekend at home a month without gray. And so then that one weekend, it's like, okay, I need to do all of the household stuff that's not getting done. Like I need to like vacuum because Mm -hmm. my house hasn't been vacuumed in a month. And like, I need to, you know, like, so trying to like do that household stuff that needs to get done. And then it was like, okay, I also need to like have a social life, like maybe like go out with some friends and see them so that I don't lose all my friends. Um, I also need to catch up on all this work that I haven't been doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I was feeling super burnt out by it. So like, that was a big part of it. I got really burnt out from traveling. Um, and just feeling like I was constantly trying to figure out what was next and never actually taking any time, like really just to relax. I don't even know if I read a book last year, like, or maybe one, um, or, or even like relish the things that you are doing in the moment, it, right? Because there's once once you're in that cycle of go go go, you you really are. The momentum is so strong that you do just keep going, and you don't take any minutes to think about like the present and what's happening. Exactly. Um, yeah. And and I felt like, and I said this to my mom at one point. We were talking, and I was like, I was like, I feel like there's there's 40 fires around me, and I'm just like trying to put out whatever one is closest to me all mm-hmm. of the time, like. There was just so much, and um, and I like I gained a bunch of weight because I wasn't taking care of myself, and I um, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was just like not. I just wasn't. There were so many things that I was failing at, but the biggest thing that I really felt horrible about was I was like not present for Gray. Mm-hmm. You know, like he would. There was one day that there was something that happened at his school. I had seen emails about it or whatever, but like didn't really think about it. And I went to pick him up and he was, it was like this, like where the parents could come and visit the classroom and the kids would show their parents around. And I went to pick him up from school at like, you know, whatever time. And all these parents were there and I like showed up like, just like, okay, it's time to go. And he was so sad that I hadn't come to this thing and it broke my heart. And I was just like, what am I doing? Like I'm, I, the person I should be giving energy to, I'm not. Right. 
and he's only going to be a child once and he's only going to want me to come to this stuff <laughs> now you know? for a little more yeah for a little <laughs> while longer right and um and so I really I had to make that decision that I couldn't I couldn't keep doing what I was doing at the pace I was going mm -hmm. um because it wasn't, it wasn't really good for me. It wasn't good for my family. Um, and it's really hard when people want you to come and teach or people want you to come and do things and you want to, and you enjoy it. Right. Um, and, but then to say, and it's, I, I also really want to always make everybody happy. And so it was really hard for me to start to learn to say no. Yeah. Um, but That's so important, so important. And even with your own creativity, I mean, Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but it seems like um, uh, as soon as you started saying no, you were able to kind of dive back into your own creativity and develop different, you know, yeah. different yeah. pieces. I, and... really, I was feeling stuck and mm -hmm. I, I have still been feeling a little bit in a rut, um, but I, I feel like things are starting to happen. But a lot of that is because for like the last five months, I've like been very inward. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time alone, a lot of time alone. Um, I, like even with my friendships and stuff, it's not like I'm out in the world all the time. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I spend a lot of nights at home by myself. Um, when, even when I don't have gray and, and I really needed that. I've slept a lot. I've rested a lot. I've been, you know, like actually reading again and like, you know, and, and I, my biggest hobby that I love is I love to cook. And so I've been, you know, doing a lot more cooking and, and, just, you know, things like that, or like just even having conversations, like my next door neighbor is a, a great person. And so I love like sitting down and having a conversation with him or, you know, just stuff like that, that I feel like I wasn't giving myself that much space to do last mm -hmm. year. Um, and so I had to slow down, but I feel like it's like planting those seeds. And this is kind of like that period where things in my life feel a little like they nothing like huge happening right now. But it feels okay because I'm hoping that like this will lead to much bigger things now that I'm giving myself some space to like discover what else I need. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's, I, it is. It's all percolating, kind of, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it feels hard because I think, especially, I felt like you know last year it was like every week I was like I'm going to be teaching a class, I'm going to be having a show, I'm going to be doing this, and blah, blah, blah. and and so this year I feel like God, what am I doing? But at the same time. I know that I, I just couldn't keep doing what I was doing. It was mm -hmm. just, so, um, you know, I think it's good to, <laughs> to get back, you know, figure right. the, find, but. find that balance again. Well, I have to say yeah. it's interesting because you had, had said about that time that you were doing all these things and yet you were feeling like a, such a failure, um, personally on a lot of other fronts, but it's so interesting because when you think about what, uh, what it looked like over Instagram was <laughs> like, she's owning the world. Right. And, um, so percept, I just, you know, just, just a comment on it is that perception is so interesting in that way. And, and that, yeah. yes, it looks like you're doing a lot of, and you are, you were, you were doing a lot, move, you know, moving and shaking and traveling a lot and doing all that stuff, but then inside feeling like totally different than what that persona was on the outside. Yeah. So, yeah. um, you know, it is interesting and just important for all, I think everyone to realize that, what what we perceive on social media is oftentimes quite different than what's actually happening. I totally, yeah. I totally agree. And I used to, I, I was talking about this recently with somebody about how like there was, especially when I first was going through my divorce and everything. And I, I would like share a lot of like really vulnerable and personal information on Instagram. Like I would sometimes write about these things I was going through and I, I kind of stopped doing that. And not because I don't think it's important to share. I, I think it is. Why I kind of stopped doing it is because I felt like every time I said something, I'd be like, oh, this is so hard or whatever. And then I would always like try to end it on this like upswing, you know, mm -hmm. like, but like, and I'm still grateful for all I have. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and I am grateful for all I, I have. I think I have a super magical life. And I think it's I have more than what most people in the world have. Like, I, I have no doubts about that. Like, I, I feel really grateful for for everything. Um but I also think like sometimes like having to have this like everything's going to be great or I'm so yeah. great. It's like it's not it doesn't feel real when you're not like it, like for people to always say that sometimes I feel like it just starts to feel inauthentic. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's like, you know, it's OK to like not want to share. It's OK to like kind of feel bad sometimes and just like be in it or to be like, 
I need to really focus on this other, like this year I've spent a lot more time actually with my kid, with his classmates. I've like volunteered at a school. I didn't do that once last year, Right. you know, and, um, you know, being able to do some of that stuff, which it's like, I don't need to post about it on Instagram because it's boring. Nobody wants, nobody cares about my kid. Like, (laughs) Like, I don't, like, that's, you know, whatever. Like, you don't, nobody cares. I, like, made pom-poms at a school. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I feel like I struggle with that constantly, personally. So I'm like, all I have to post, actually, that seems interesting is, like, to me, as interesting as my kids. Like, but, you know, what? who cares? Well, that's, like, the thing is, like, we built this whole, like, Lego Minecraft village, and I was so excited about it because I love building Legos. And, um, and I'm like, oh man. And I like, I think I posted a picture in like stories or something, but I'm like, God, like this is, <laughs> and maybe people want to see it. I think that's know actually really cool. <laughs> but like, <laughs> sometimes I'm just like, oh yeah, this is like real life. Like this is, and which is good. I think it's good to show your real life. But um, I, I think I've just been struggling with that. Like, what do people actually, like, do people care? Do people, like, does my real life matter? Like, why am I so narcissistic that I think that my life is important that people want? I don't know. No, so people, I get into that loop too. I totally get into that loop. And you know why? Because I see people who do it really well, who show the slivers of their life and actually make it look really interesting, even when it's dull as shit. And, it, you know, but but it looks interesting. It looks fun. And I'm like, oh, they're such a good mom. Like, they're even, like, playing with their kids and filming it at the same time. But then I get in the reality of that and I try to film it and I'm like this is dumb you know <laughs> exactly exactly or I'm like like just trying to like film gray and he's like stop filming me and I'm like well now I can't post this on Instagram exactly you ruined it, <laughs> like, you ruined it. I'm an asshole for always like <laughs> my kid <laughs> yeah so I don't know I mean I think it's, it's a Instagram is a funny thing it is it's a and it's hard to know and I'm not a millennial but I'm not like a Gen Xer. Yeah, we're in that same weird, that weird yeah. uh, cusp generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in '79. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Go so, 79ers. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a it's a weird place to be in. I try yeah. to figure out how to navigate it well. Yeah. Um, I mean, and speaking of Instagram, you know, and just the fiber art community, how we're seeing such a boom right now. Yeah. Um, how does that? How does that? Uh, how do you feel about it? Um, I know there's a lot of thoughts on this, so it might be, we might be going way too into it, but, uh, (laughs) um, I think it's really incredible to see people be interested in it. Like, I think, um, I, I I think it'll be really interesting in like 10 years to like look back at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think it's, it's really interesting because I feel like fiber arts, like, especially like learning about the history of it and seeing how it's, you know, transformed and, and the things that have kind of like held value over time, you know, like, like somebody like Sheila Hicks, Mm -hmm. like you look at her and she's still making work. That's incredible. And has been forever. She's never lost any momentum. She's never like, you know, other people are like, Oh yeah, I did some macrame in the seventies and then it like went away or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And it's like, you have these other people who just like have never stopped and have. And so it's like, how, so obviously there's like this whole contingent of people that are doing this like hobby, you know, like they're making some stuff and, you right. know, the, the art versus craft dilemma, which I feel like right. I'm struggling with in my own mind as uh, even in the way that I think about, uh, I think about the podcast or I think about just what the industry is doing, you know, how do you kind of separate that? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I'm, I mean, I think I have a, obviously I have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, I, I'm very excited that people are so intrigued by it. Um, I'm really excited that so many people want to do it. I also find it so fascinating because of having a platform like Instagram, mm-hmm. like I get emails. I, I got an email, um, last week, uh, from a woman in, um, Uruguay who is like inspired by more my work and like sent me a picture of like a piece she had made because she was like, I really love your work. And like, I made this because it like inspired me. Mm-hmm. Like how incredible to have a platform where like instantly you, the entire world can see something that you're making. Yeah. Amazing. It's just it amazing. Um, and so I, I find that so fascinating and I'm curious to see how it's going to, um, translate in, in the art world over time, yeah. you know, and, and what will be the things that will go by the wayside and what will be the things that will push people to move further on and, mm-hmm. and what, will, what will end up in museums and galleries versus, you know, what is something that someone's making for their, you know, 
showing their kids or they're making for their friend or whatever, um, which is all important and significant. Um, and it's just, but it's just a curious thing, I think, at this point of seeing what will happen next. Um, right. It's like a cultural identity kind of thing. Like, are we going to look back in 30 years and say the same way that people are now like, oh, macrame from right. the 70s, you know, are they going to look back and go, oh, that, that fiber <laughs> art boom of the, what are we Those in? Means. <laughs> the 2010, 20, 20s, whatever, whatever right, are right, right yeah. now. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, so I, I mean, I think it'll be curious to see how it, how it translates over time. Mm-hmm. Um, what I find really fascinating actually is, um, and, and especially being in the couple of, um, Facebook groups, um, like the, where people are, they, there's a lot of questions on a lot of conversation about like, you know, I want to make this thing. And now there's all these video tutorials, mm-hmm. um, which I think is great. And it's so interesting to me to see people's first pieces now compared to even what people are making as their first pieces five years ago, because there's so much more information out there for your first time when you're learning versus like what I have, you know what I mean? Oh my God, I know you're so right. When I see some people's first pieces, I'm like, how in the world is that your first piece? Like that took me until like piece 10 or 20 (laughs) or something. I'm like, what the hell? (laughs) and so I find that and, and not, and maybe they're just super talented, of course, but like, also it's just like, there's so much, there's stuff that like it, I felt like I didn't know, mm-hmm. like I didn't know how to make a triangle. I just right. didn't know, I figured it out or whatever. Um, but I didn't, I didn't watch a video tutorial. I didn't have any books even at the beginning. And even if you searched on, you know, YouTube or anything, like there weren't video, there weren't, a, there wasn't a YouTube weaving channel or right. anything, you know what I mean? Right. It wasn't like you could go and and do that. And so it's, you know, that's very interesting to me to see how much it's changed in the last five or six years. Totally. Um, oh, wait. Okay. And- I have, a, uh, sorry, I have a fun, <laughs> funny story to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> so the very first weaving I did, so I'm self-taught, meaning I have all my information from the internet and mm-hmm. um, I did it based on a tutorial that is on, um, honestly, WTF, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't realize at the time <laughs> You had taught the girl who wrote that tutorial. Yes. So essentially, I learned how to weave from you. How <laughs> cool is that? Is, that is so cool. I that know. is so funny. I can't believe that. I didn't really realize that until like last week when I was thinking about this interview. And I was like, oh, I need to go back and look at that tutorial. And like, when did I learn all this? And then I look back and I was like, oh my God, this is Megan. <laughs> that is so funny. Like yes. in a roundabout way. Yes. Yeah. Well, and because she did a part of why she took the class and did that tutorial was because Um, people were asking her about weaving, you Mm. know, through her blog and she, and not a ton of people were teaching weaving workshops back then. I mean, I mean, I think I was the only one in the Bay area at the time teaching weaving. And now, I mean, it's like every other, uh, every other coffee shop. (laughs) Right. Exactly. They're everywhere. And I think, I think it's great because there's still people who want to learn. So Mm -hmm. like if there's a market for it, great. And I certainly, I mean, at this point I'm not really teach. I'm teaching, I have a class in June, but that'll be my first class this year that I'm teaching. Yeah. Um, and so, and the class I teach now is so totally different than the class that I taught back then. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I just, I find it so intriguing how much it's changed and how much people have gotten into it. And I'm, I'm curious too, if, um, especially the people who are doing it as kind of more hobbyist craft um, kind of people. Like one of the things that I've noticed and, and where I've always said, I think that there's room for all of us um, is that a lot of times the people who are like, Oh, I want to come teach your, take your weaving workshop. I think it's really cool. And like they make a couple weavings. A lot of times though, those are the people who will then come and buy work from me right. because then they can also appreciate how much work it is or like the, ta- or you know, whatever, totally. like what goes into, making things. And so they're like, Oh, wow. Like, yeah, I can make something, but I'm not going to like dedicate the hours and hours and hours to get to like this place that I want to have in my right. home, you know, this thing that I want in my home. Um, and so I'm curious if like this kind of movement of people being so into fiber art is going to help fiber art really gain a foothold in the fine art community mm-hmm. in a way that it hadn't before. Um, cause I mean, yes, it has been, um, in the fine art community, but it's like definitely, it's not like painting Mm -hmm. or something, you know what I mean? Which is, or like sculpture, which I think has like, has such a different kind of connotation. So I'm curious about that. Or even in the level of, um, well, on the gallery side, Mm -hmm. you know, there's the museum side and the gallery side, but yeah, like what's, what will, what will, uh, what will be our cultural markers 
in several years, which would be like what's shown in museums that later and then yeah. versus, you know, what, what the market looks like now. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah. It's also interesting to me. Um, yeah. yeah. And like, even I've noticed like with working with galleries is like when I have a show in the summer, I'm not going to sell a thing. It is like, it's like cricket. It's like right. nobody buying five art in the summer at a gallery. Like I will get commissions still and also, you know, whatever, but at a gallery, it's like nothing. Wintertime, great. Like, Why I can, is that? Why is that, Ethan? Well, I, especially my work, it's so heavy and warm. Right. I'm sure in the summertime, you're like, it's 100 degrees. I don't even want to think about that thing. Getting here, <laughs> <Right. you know? laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's really interesting to like kind of, which, you know, I've learned through trial and error. But so it's it's definitely an interesting thing that, you know, even just seeing that kind of, you know, different seasons for art and whatever. Totally. Um, and some galleries that like, want nothing to do with fiber art at this point and seeing if that will change over time as well. Right. Right. Um, cool. Um, so do you have any advice that you might offer to help other people sort of create their own voice now that the market does, you know, because we are stuck in our, especially through Instagram, we I feel I'm stuck in this sort of fiber art tunnel and it's yeah. all, all that I look at. And so I feel like it's even bigger than it is. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so it feels a bit saturated. Um, how, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's trying to sort of create their own space or voice? Um, um, well, I, think I, I have a couple of things that I usually try to tell people. Like, I think when you're first learning, I think it's totally okay to look at other people's work and, you know, take elements from it or I don't know look at my work, copy what I make. You don't need to post on Instagram mm -hmm. or try to sell it because then that's kind of, you know, makes an artist not feel awesome all the time. Um, but, you know, if you're learning, how do we learn to paint? Like you look at other, what people have done before you, right? Exactly. So like, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that um, or taking different elements from different things that you like while you're learning and create a craft. Don't try to sell that work mm -hmm. when you're just learning. Don't just say like, oh, I made this thing one time. Now I need to open right. this. This is my mind. design. I created this. Right. Exactly. It's like, learn. Yes. Ouch. Learn, 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 play, have fun. Yep. Um, the first year or so that I was weaving, um, definitely, I mean, the first year and then even after that a lot, I gave away almost everything. Um, because I, I mean, frankly, I was like copying other people's shit or right, like right. Or being like, that looks cool. I want to learn how to do fringe like that. And like, you know, making stuff that was really inspired, like, <laughs> right. let's be honest, like air quote inspired. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah, I was just like looking at what somebody else was doing that I thought was cool and trying to figure it out, which is yeah. like what you should do when you're learning. Right, so exactly. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Do it. Um, but then learn the skills, learn the craft, learn how to do it. Um, and then start to figure out, like play with different materials or, um, do something that you've never seen anybody do. And even if someone else has done it, it's okay. But like, try to do, like, try to use your own creativity to like, be like, Oh, what if I put, you know, this piece of roving here or this yarn here, or like ball this thing up and wrap it all up and then somehow weave it in or whatever, like do right. experiment that you have never seen happen before yeah. and it might be gross and, or you might love it. Like, it's just, you know, it's like, you got to try different things. Um, so I think that, I think another thing that I really try to do, don't only look at fiber artists. Like mm -hmm. I always, um, I, I follow a lot of Instagram, a lot of photographers who I love their colors, like colors that they use and like find myself really inspired by, um, really looking at different like interiors, um, like that is a huge thing for me is like, I don't, and I follow a lot of fiber artists, but what I, if I'm trying to find inspiration, I'm going to look at architecture. Mm -hmm. I look at, um, there's one of my very favorite, um, artists is Fernando Botero, who's a Colombian painter, uh, and sculptor and the colors he uses just like kill me. And so like, I will open up one of my books and look at his colors to get inspired. Um, or, you know, like I said, or with like photographers or, you know, look at Pantone or what I like, try to look at different things that aren't, aren't necessarily fiber art right. to get, to gain inspiration. Um, because I think sometimes if you're just looking if you're spending your entire feed is just looking at weaving after weaving after weaving after weaving, and that's all your inspiration is, it's almost impossible not to just be copying yep, other people. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, Even by and, accident, you know, because it gets it gets lodged in your brain. Exactly, and I've done it. I actually had a, a thing 
um, a few months ago that I'd made for a show and I hung it up. It was at the show. And then like two days later, I was like scrolling through Instagram and saw that I was like, oh my God, I, and it was like a friend of mine. And I like, and I wrote to her and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like I basically made a thing that you made and it's a show. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, (laughs) and it was totally unintended. And I've had that happen. I had a show last year where I made, I hung a piece up in this one way. And this other artist who is a person who I know who is, she, um, she doesn't live in the Bay area anymore, but she did at the time. And she like wrote to me and sent me a picture of one of her pieces. And she's like, Hey, uh, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but, and I, I was mortified, mortified. I was just like, Oh my God, I cannot. And like, it was a piece of hers that was like a few years. It was from like 2014 or something. Right. And I, I was just like, and it was just the way I hung it. Like I could hang it different ways. Right. So the next day I went to the gallery and like rehung it in a totally different configuration. Um, but I was mortified because yeah. it was like, she's a person who I love and respect her work and would never want to copy her. You know what I right, mean? Right, right. It's, it's so, so unintentional. I, yeah. Right. And, but it's one of those things. If all you're looking at is fiber art, then it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's in. Um, and so I, you know, I really want to encourage people like definitely follow fiber art, see what is going on, see what your contemporaries are doing, especially if you find somebody who is pushing boundaries or doing something really cool or different and that you love, absolutely like watch their work, support them, you know, comment, buy their work, mm-hmm. you know, um, do all of that. Like I save up, I try to buy at least like, um, you know, a piece or two from other artists every year because I love their work and I can't, I don't have tons of disposable income, so it's not like I can be constantly buying stuff, but, you know, occasionally I try to. Um, And, um, but, you know, also try to find the other things that, like, really make you excited. Um, And when you go outside of the medium, it's... um it will inspire you in a different way too. Absolutely. just, and something, so something magical happens that, that no one else has done before because you're right. taking it from something else, you know? Yeah. Well, I saw, a th- I'm working on a collaboration with a friend who is a ceramicist and I saw something the other day that was a lamp and I saw it and I was like, we're going to make this thing. But like, so it's like, we were inspired from a lamp, right? you know, <laughs> which is like, not what either of us do, but it's like, that is like the kind of thing of being like, oh, I love the way that this shape is. Right. And then being like, how can we do this with our mediums? Right. Um, so like, that's the kind of thing I think that like, sometimes you have to kind of think outside the box a little and like, look, look at things differently. Um, and then the other advice I always, I always like to give to people is, especially when you're first starting out, say yes to everything. I said, mm-hmm. yes, to everything. Um, everything that I could anyway. Um, and because you never know what's going to work and you never know what you're going to love, and you don't know what you're going to hate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so say yes to everything that you can. That's, like, reasonable. Um, and once you do that for a while and you learn what works and what doesn't work, then learn to say no. It's mm-hmm. uh, such great you advice. Thing for everyone all of the time. Um, and, and I think another thing that I see a lot is, like, people inquiring about, you know, their um, – in our, I feel like in the Facebook group kind of thing, um, is like about doing work. Um, like, you know, they'll be like, Oh, a blog asked me for something and, you know, should I give it to them or whatever? And, um, I think you have to always, it's a one by one basis, right? Do your Um, research, do your research about them and whatever, but it's not an automatic. No, Mm -hmm. I still give, I still give stuff away for free. I still, or we'll let people borrow things. Um, and, um, I, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to totally disclose all of this. I'll just be a little vague about it. I probably am allowed to, I don't know why I wouldn't be, but (laughs) I don't sign an NDA or anything, but, um, there was a television show that asked to have a weaving and they said they would buy it. Um, and I was like, you know, you guys can just borrow it. It's fine. And this is a TV show that's going to be on this summer on NBC. And um, what? Like, why know, didn't you make them buy it? <laughs> Their production budgets are huge, girl. <laughs> right. I know. See, this is this is what everybody would told me. And in my gut, I was like, nope, it's okay. You guys can just borrow it. It's cool. And uh, because I thought to myself, all I have to do when this weaving comes back, all I have to say is this weaving's on the show and it'll sell. So I was like, that's right. cool for me. Like, that's great. Whatever. Um and then a couple of weeks after I'd sent it to them, they wrote to me and one of the stars of the show bought it. Oh, so that's I it. too cool. 
<laughs> but now I sold it to, and it's like a person who I super, super, super admire. And I'm not like a celebrity person. Right. No, but that's still so exciting. And it's a celebrity that I actually follow their work and like so excited. And so I was just like, I can't believe it. So now I'm so glad that I just let them borrow it. Right. Yeah. Like, Cause then now that person has my weaving. It's not just sitting in a prop room and at NBC. That's awesome. Um, and so like, that's the thing is sometimes just like, listen to your gut about like, if someone asks for free stuff or asks to, or an interior designer, I had one who was like, can I borrow some work for staging? I was like, sure. And then somebody bought it, you know? So, right. you know, sometimes you just have to be like, especially if it's just laying around your house, get it out into the world. Definitely. Like, definitely. There's no reason for things to be piled up at your house. Um, so those are my, that's my advice. That's such great <laughs> advice. Thank you so much. And now I'm like thinking about all these things. I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> Um, can, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I, I feel very business minded. And so my advice to a lot of people is to like, make sure you know your worth and your value and don't do free things and all this stuff. Um, because so many people just starting out are so willing to give it out for free. Um, right. But yeah, there is definitely a flip side. And um, yeah, it's really interesting well, yeah. to think about, you know, uh, on the flip side of that, I will also say another uh, advice that was given to me very early on was don't sell your work. Don't price your work or I'm sorry, let me start. Over. Sell your, ah, <laughs> price your work to sell, not to sell fast. And so I think yes. that goes a lot into the knowing your worth, knowing your value, uh, you know, um, knowing that you're, this isn't about how the cost of your materials plus hours spent. Like right. when I see all of these kind of um, people who try to have these like, um, you know, formula and that I was thinking, but you created a design from your brain, right? you know, like you don't, like Bill Gates, do you think that he pays himself hourly? Like, right. <laughs> right. No, he created this amazing thing for the world. And he did. And not, I'm not comparing myself to Bill Gates. Let me just be clear. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, this is something that, like, a creativity that was born of me. Right. Um, and so it's not about, like, well, my materials were $300 and I worked on it for 10 hours. And so, therefore, it's going to cost this much. It's like, it's like, no, like also how many emails did I send and not just to this person in my life because I, this is my work or mm -hmm. like, what am I, how many hours do I spend on my website or like all of the things that we do each week that go into why this piece is now becoming a thing in the right. world. Right. Um, and so it's all intertwined. So I, I think like that, I agree with you. You have to know your worth. You have to set your prices in a way that makes sense and is competitive. And also like, frankly, don't be undercutting the other fiber artists. Yes, that's a huge like, thing. That kills me when I see people, sorry, anybody out there who's selling their work for $35, but like, come on, guys, yeah. like, what you should be selling. You're not Target. Like, don't be selling your work for $35. Exactly. No, I, I definitely 100% agree with that. And it devalues everyone else too. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's just going to make everybody mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I just, like, that always... Um, like I try not even to go on Etsy because so often I see that stuff and I'm just like, oh, you guys, you worked so hard on this and it's beautiful. And I, I get it. You're making a sale, but like, like you, you deserve more than this. Yeah. You do. Like this is artwork. Yeah. This is, or even if you just see it as your craft work, like you spent hours on this. This is a thing that came from your heart. Mm -hmm. Like show that. Right. Absolutely. Oh, I totally agree. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I want to be very mindful of your time also, but I'm just going to ask a few quick like lightning round questions. Yes. Okay. I, um, I'll try to talk so much. <laughs> no, no. I love it. That's the thing is like I, I could, I feel like I could talk to you forever and I hope that if I, um, you know, if people love listening to this podcast that I can have you on again and we can just chat it out. I feel like there's so much to cover. <laughs> um, but okay. So here, let's see the lightning round questions. Um, uh, what is one of the things on your bucket list? Uh, <laughs> um, I would love to have work in a museum. Oh, awesome. Um, if you had one free hour a day, what would you do with it? Nap. Good call. I think I do the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you had a time machine, what point in the past or future would you visit? Ooh, um, damn. That one's hard. Uh, 1920s in like during prohibition. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. Oh, definitely. 
there, there's a lot of good work I think that could come out of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> um, okay, and the last one is what is your favorite, your current favorite Instagram account? I know this is kind of hard to think of, but. Um, hmm. Wow, that's, that is a tough one. I know, and then you uh, have to think of like what the names are actually of, the, of them that you see every day. <laughs> right, right. Uh, oh, um, an artist that I just discovered and that I just asked him if I could have a studio visit, but I'm super into and other, um, let me, yeah, let me look up his Instagram real quick. <laughs> um, um, is so Crispy he- Martin, Chris Martin, so his thing is Crispy Martin. Crispy um, Martin. he, he is, um, he does like graphic design and then also, um, like some textile work and uh he's uh he's black and he does a lot of stuff that is like very much about like the black experience like and especially right now where we're going through this like you know so much like um starting to understand that we've been raised in this like white supremacist society right. and like how that's like affecting everything right now um and so he does a lot of like um there's a lot of like ropes and like stuff like that. So of course that Mm. speaks to me as like this, as like a fiber artist. Um, and, and like just wanting, so anyway, I'm going to try to go see his studio next week. So that's so cool. And I'm definitely going to check out that account. It sounds really, really cool. Yeah. So I'm I'm interested. I mean, that's like something that I, I've only, a friend of mine is friends with him. And so like, I just was introduced to him like a week ago. And so I've been like really excited about, about the work that he's doing. Um, Yeah. So, so yeah, I think that's probably one of my ones right now, but I don't know. Like I said, there's a lot of photographers that I follow that I get really into because I love like, well, my, my best friend, Erin Conger, I love, like she's been doing super moody stuff lately, which I really love. And then I have this friend, Anna Alexia, who does really color saturated things that I always think are really beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's stuff like that, that I really love. Um, cool. I'll, I'll definitely have to go check them out. And I'm pretty sure our listeners are going to go follow them too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. This was such a pleasure. And I feel like I learned so much and it was just so fascinating to hear your story and how you've well, gotten to where you are. Sometimes we'll have to talk and then you can talk so I can hear all about you. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe, we'll do, maybe we'll do an interview where you interview me and that yeah, will be like my backstory. <laughs> I would love to do that. I think that'd be really fun. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And um, hopefully I will talk to you again soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Check the show notes of each episode to get the website and Instagram for each of the fiber artists I speak with. Be sure to give them a follow. And you can view video from this podcast on neuromastudio.com slash the fiber artist podcast. If you enjoy the fiber artist podcast, go to Apple podcast to subscribe, rate and review. Thank you for listening.